Welcome back to another episode of the Royals Farm Report podcast. My name is Alex Duvall. Joel is driving back in the middle of a borderline tornado storm in Oklahoma. So hopefully he's making his way home. He is not with us tonight. Josh is with me as always. Joshua, I appreciate you joining us, joining me. Appreciate you being here on the show. Um, we're going to do a little draft coverage tonight, Josh. Are you go, like are you big watch the NFL draft guy? Um. I, I'll probably watch the first round more so than obviously the the second, third, and fourth and resounding seventeen rounds of draft uh, coverage there is, unless we're talking to guys from the Kansas City Laboratory like we are tonight. <laughs> I know that this one is big. Watch the draft guy, and I will use any excuse to light up my smoker and drink with my buddies. So the draft is a holiday for me because it's an excuse to do those things. Um, can, is there a way that we can make the first round not take four hours on Thursday night? No, there's no chance. And I'm I'm going to soak in every single minute of it. Like you should just maybe just start the smoker at the beginning of the first round. And then by the end of it, it's like a reward. Like maybe that's how you should do it. I don't know. But I uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm geeked out. I'm beyond geek for this week because like it's just a bit of everything. I'm beyond geeked to be on with you guys, too, by the way. I'm so excited that Royals Farm reports with Casey said. I mean, you guys know how I feel about you. You know how much I love you. But I should have wore the hat today is what I should have done. Mm. But, uh, yeah, man, I'm geeked about the draft. It's going to be it's gonna be fun. Well, we are excited to have you on, and that has been made possible this year by Kansas City Strength and Conditioning. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at our sponsor. From the beginning, we knew right away that we wanted to do strength conditioning and a throwing program for the baseball and softball community. It wasn't something we were trying to back into or all of a sudden learn. We knew we were really good at these coaching these skills from the get-go. And the fact that we're in the same business and the employees are all on the same page, you know, we can write a program based off of what a kid needs, not just getting him stronger or faster from a general sense. It's what does this kid need? On the pitching end, we can say, hey, this kid needs such and such. He needs to do this or that better. A lot of times it turns out it's not something that needs to be fixed in the baseball cage or on the throwing mound, it actually needs to be fixed in the weight room. All right, big thanks to KCSC for picking up the show this year. Um, Scott Barlow trained out there this offseason. If you've got a teenager needs to get a work, get some work in, baseball, softball, or otherwise, um, I, I said teenager, any, any kid of any age, send them out there. I coach high school baseball in the area, and and some of the results I've seen from kids who work out out there is is impressive. And I've started to to try to swing some kids out there, and uh, because they're the best at what they do. So big thanks to him for picking up the show. All right, Kent. If there's look, we're, so what we're gonna do, by the way, for everybody else watching, we're gonna have Kent talk to us for five ten minutes here about NFL draft talk, and then Josh and I are gonna spend the next thirty minutes or so talking about the MLB draft for the first time in 2022 on this podcast. If you've been following over at royalsfarmreport.com, you'll notice that I have uh, started writing about the draft um, periodically. I think there we've had five or six articles up. I released our top 10 draft prospects last week. So um, anyway, we're going to talk a little about NFL draft with a draft coming up on Thursday, and then we'll talk about the MLB draft for the next 30 minutes or so of the show. So Kent, if there is one thing that the Chiefs need to do in the NFL draft, like if you could if you could click a magic button, like my favorite like reference point for this is Carrington's hypothetical button game, but like you get to push the magic button and that one thing happens for the Chiefs this weekend, what is that thing? Ooh, I I think it's that they trade up for an edge rusher in the first round. Um this team really badly needs a guy that can you know provide a little bit of juice off the edge, not just for this year, but for next year uh, and, and years to come. And so, um, you know, they brought Frank Clark back. They, you know, they have, they have some solid rotational pieces, but they really need to improve a pass rush. That was really bad last year. I mean, we don't talk enough about how this, you know, this team really needed help, you know, to, you know, to try to generate some, some pressure on the quarterback and they brought Melvin Ingram in and he gave a little bit of a, a little bit of juice there, but, at the same time, they didn't have enough, and so they got to start this year with a, with a big swing. And I, I hope they trade up. Honestly, I hope they make a, a big move up to go get one. 
You know, in baseball, we talk all the time about, I mean, this show is centered around the minor leagues. We go into draft season, we draft a guy, and then it's like Bobby Witt Jr., right? Th three years later, we get to see the fruit of that pick pay off. And really, as, as much as he's struggling, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but as, as much as he's struggling, it's going to be four years before we can really watch that pay off. If we take – if the Chiefs' first-round pick on Thursday – takes four years to develop it is a failed pick right so yeah, yeah how does how does the draft how do those assets become measured like what is a 29th overall pick worth to you as an organization because the 29th pick in baseball is a dart thrown at a board mm -hmm. hopefully this guy plays major league baseball in five years but mm -hmm. what is that in football like how how much more valuable do the picks become well, I mean, they become they're they're valuable, and but they're, they're still there's there's still there's still cliffs, <clears throat> there's still cliffs that happen even in the first round of the draft. You know, NFL teams there's not 32 first round grades. Nobody in the NFL has 32 first round grades uh, on their board. I, it's normally you know somewhere between you know, as few as 12 and you know 12 and 20 is where you normally see a lot of these NFL drafts having true first round grades on their prospects. So. Um, you know, pick 29 is still valuable. It's a guy that's going to probably, you know, if, he, if he's not contributing in a real way, he's not providing, um, you know, a lot of snaps, quality snaps and some production, then then you made, you know, you made a mistake. You're probably it's, it's hard to find a and we'll talk about defensive end. It's hard to find a, a double digit sack type guy at 29. It doesn't happen a ton, but you can find a really quality player that you know, maybe gets a decent second year or second deal with you, you know, at 29. I think you're really, you know, the first round picks and second round picks, honestly, you're trying to find guys that you're willing to give second contracts to is really what it is. You mentioned defensive end. So in baseball, we try to tell people all the time, you draft the best player available because you may need a center fielder now, but in four years, the best free agent available might be a center fielder. And then, you know, your center fielder may not have worked out. Just draft the best bat. And then kind of like literally we have a, a microcosm of that in Omaha right now where you have two really good first basemen, a catcher with Salvi already in the big leagues. It's like we tell people all the time, draft the bat. We'll find a place for them to play, you know, as we go. And now we're kind of working on that. You mentioned defensive end. How likely is it? that the Chiefs can draft somebody on Thursday night that immediately starts at slots into their starting lineup on defense at, at end, because in baseball, there is no way to do that. It is almost entirely impossible. Uh, I mean, the Royals did it with Brandon Finnegan in 14, but that is like a once he was literally the first player to yeah. go from world series to world series. Right. So how, how valuable is it and how likely is it that they can draft somebody that slots in and plays right away? You basically mentioned Vinny Pascatino, by the way, in the first 10 minutes. I saw that. That's I, I had the under, and I'm counting that. Um, <laughs> and that might be a record for the like, longest time. I know. I'm surprised this isn't like the Vinny Pascatino report. Don't think I haven't tried. And, yep. Yeah, I figured as much. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, no, they'll, 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 they can find, if you're asking if they can find a guy that can contribute right away, they can. They absolutely can. Now, some guys are definitely going to be like, the weird thing with the NFL draft is like, to your point, like some guys, you're probably going to be looking for, you know, somebody that maybe is a little bit you know, sometimes, sometimes you're looking for projections so that maybe year one is kind of a, a, a dull, you know, year. And then years two through four and actually five with the, with the fifth year option that you have as a first rounder, you're looking for some of those guys that might be, may, might be big projections, or you're looking for some guys that can kind of contribute right away. Or there's sometimes like a mix of both. Like there's kind of some, you got to make some decisions there with your assets a little bit differently. I mean, it's kind of college versus, it's kind of college versus minors kids, or, uh, high school kids a little bit too. You know, like there's a little bit of that, like quicker, how quickly can we get this guy? In? But um, there's definitely some guys that the Chiefs are going to be able to find at 29 and 30 that can contribute immediately. Now it's not going to be some, you know, game changer. It's not going to be, you know, like, sometimes it is, but it depends on the position. Like maybe the Chiefs can find a receiver that, comes in and is uber productive in the back end of the first round but um trying to find some of these positions is really really tricky but they're gonna have the they, they got four picks in the first two rounds three of them will play a lot of snaps this year i would imagine for this team so let's kind of put it put it all together here kind of what you said you've talked about cliffs you've talked about edge rush you've talked about wide receivers and you kind of talk about their position and kind of what you want to see them do and a lot of people are kind of thinking that 
you know, wide receiver, D end, and some kind of form in the secondary is going to be kind of where the Chiefs' biggest needs lie. So yeah. let's say hypothetically they address both defensive positions, like you're get an edge rush, whether they grab or trade up to go get it, and then they get somebody in the secondary, still trying to figure out what's going on at wide receiver. What kind of a gap or cliff, like you talked about earlier, lies in between those guys that are realistically going to be at the back end of day one compared to the guys that would probably be around there at the end of the you know second round or potentially into the third? What's what's the risk reward that that, that kind of looks like and uh, yeah. kind of what it's going to lead to whenever they got Kelsey, they've got Juju, they've got MVS, they've got McColl, uh, all these receiving running backs potentially. What's that going to look like risk reward between the gap between day one and day two guys? Well, that's where it's going to be interesting to see how this this team approaches it because they can be pretty strategic because there are um, definitely like some positions that have a little bit more depth and, you know, um, wide receiver. Like I, you talk about addressing cornerback and and edge early. Like I think that that's really smart uh, because I think you might be able to find better value at um at wide receiver maybe a little bit later at pick 50 uh potentially you know you might be able to kind of finagle the board a little bit and prioritize some positions where the cliffs are a little bit more drastic uh so addressing them early and then going ahead and getting a receiver um maybe a little bit later um i think there's there's quality players that the chiefs could get you know at pick 50 at receiver and so you maybe try some people might say you're trying to get a little too cute but you know, take your corner, take your edge early, and then and then try to go find value, uh, you know, in the middle of the second round. Okay, rapid fire, real quick, and we'll get you out of here. You ready? Let's go. Okay, even odds, you get a free hundred dollar bet. Do the Chiefs make one or two picks in the first round on Thursday? Two, two picks. Yes, I feel I feel very good about them making two. One hundred dollar free bet, even odds. Do the Chiefs make their first pick at twenty nine? No, they trade up, small trade up. I'll say they get into the early twenties. Free hundred dollar bet, even odds. Is the player they take either a receiver or a defensive end? Defensive end. I feel good about. It. I think they. I think they're going to wait a little bit on receiver. I think they like the value up and down the board there. So you do think it will be one of those two? Oh, it's sure. just oh, if I get both of them? Oh yeah, yeah I'll put okay. I'll put more money on. Give me give me like a thousand fake dollars. If it's not one of those two positions, what is the other pick? What what is the other position that could surprise some people? I think it's wide, wide receiver, cornerback, edge. Don't sleep on if you know maybe a defensive tackle like that could be a sneaky sneaky pick there too. Like maybe there's a defensive tackle they really like. Jordan Davis falls and they decide to trade up for him. Like just like defensive tackles, one you got to keep an eye on. Give me your three players at the top of your wish list in some sort of realistic fashion. Uh, let's go George Karloftis, the edge out of Purdue. Um, let's go George Pickens, the wide receiver out of uh, Georgia, and then let's go Bobby Witt Jr. to play receiver for Mahomes for the next decade. Bobby Witt Jr. to play receiver. You know, yeah. I saw something today. Um, he is, he has the fastest average sprint speed in major league baseball right now. He's nuts. He's a freak. Like, I know the bats not there yet. Even the bat, like, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to get too nerdy, but like, I really don't think like, I think some of his plate appearances have been pretty solid too. Like, I don't think it's entirely th been that bad. Um, the, everything athletically has been ridiculous. Like the defensive plays have been nuts and the speed and, it's crazy and shout out Bobby Stroop for some of the, some of the, some of the contortion that he's been able to put that kid through too. It's outstanding. It it really quick. Oh, go ahead, Josh. Sorry. I mean, there's that, that, that uh, pitcher and tick the ball and he barely mm -hmm. recovered and flipped it to second base. I mean, that was incredible. The, the defense lately has been ridiculous. And I, I mean, yeah, if the bats, if the bats eventually get there, crazy. Yeah, and then the Royals lost right after that play. Uh, you don't have to worry. We don't talk in, about five it. innings later. Yeah, hashtag Losses. always game. Short short term memory, Ken. <laughs> Last question: Olave or Williams? Williams, but I don't think that they have a chance of getting Williams. But yeah, I'd pick Williams. He's okay. he's awesome. Okay, that's all I got for you. 
Well, thanks, man. I love I love y'all. You know how I feel about you. I'm so excited about Royals Farm. I sh again, I should have I should have wore the hat. My that's hey, on me. That's on we me. Saw it, we saw it the other day. That's that's good. <laughs> you did wear it the other day. Hey, man. I mean, I plug y'all any chance I get. Speaking <laughs> of, go ahead and promote your draft guide real quick. Oh yeah, yeah. We're doing the KCSN draft guide. Uh, it's 300 ish pages of chief specific draft content. So if you like that uh go to gum.co slash kcsn22 or just go to my twitter account can't underscore swanson all the information is there so yeah i will i will find the link and i will i will reply to whatever tweet it comes out with a podcast i'll, re I'll reply to it so anybody that follows us that for some reason isn't following kent and the lab guys it will be there for you so kent thank you very much for your time tonight i know you're busy this week i appreciate your time I am pumped for the draft. I will be watching all four hours of grueling nonsense. It might it might how, be five. It might be five. <laughs> I know. About this is John Smith. John Smith runs a 4240. He's an outstanding receiver. And did you know that his dad did cocaine once? <laughs> yeah, let's just try to find the most tragic story and and just try to magnify that that kid's, you know, pain points in his life. That's that's mm -hmm. that's how that's how media should be, I think. So. That's the that's the money move right there. So, mm -hmm. all right, Kent, I appreciate you, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, great talking to y'all. Thanks to Kent for coming on. Make sure you get the draft guide. I can't wait for the NFL draft. Like I said, I will take any excuse to sit outside, watch football, light a fire, light the smoker, have a good time. So I am fired yeah, I mean, up about the, that. The Chiefs going into it. The Chiefs are like the most interesting team in the draft. Yes. I mean, with, as, with as many picks. picks as they have, as as crazy as the AFC West is now, they're going to be looking to see what the Chiefs are doing. I think they're going to be the most interesting team, and let's see them make some moves. I heard somebody, or I saw on Twitter, somebody said they're going to take an offensive tackle with 29 and then trade out of 30. <laughs> and that would, be something. <laughs> that would be would something. That would be something. riot. Um, <laughs> speaking of – the draft, I forgot. It's uh, in Kansas City next year, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yep. So that really will... Cool. I will be at that. I'm going to find a way to be there. Hopefully, we don't have yeah. a game or nothing. Um, that'd be fun. Mm -hmm. Let's talk some baseball. Um, Major League Baseball draft is in July. We are a few months away. We have started to crank up some draft coverage here at Royals Farm Report. Um, I released our top 10 Major League Baseball draft rankings the other day. I'll go through them real quick. Number 10, Judd Fabian, a center fielder out of Florida. Uh, some people might remember Judd Fabian from last year. Judd Fabian was like a candidate to go top five in last year's draft. Had a bunch of strikeout issues. Fell to round two. Went back to Florida. He is crushing the baseball again. Playing good defense in center field. And not striking out as much. So he's back in my top 10. Gavin Cross, I don't really know how to describe gavin cross as a hitter he has really good raw power and hits a lot of line drives now the thing with that is that was basically carter jensen's mo coming out of park hill great exit velocities just wasn't hitting the ball in the air enough for the home run numbers to show up he cranked home run number four in what is it week three of the minor league season now so yep. they the royals have shown a sudden ability to develop hitters at a, at a very good clip so <clears throat> maybe you take a guy like that say hey gavin hit the ball in the air just a little higher and it'll go over that fence out there and, and maybe it clicks for him so gavin cross i got at number nine dylan lesko uh prep right-handed pitcher out of georgia some of the most prodigious stuff that we've seen from a prep righty in a long time i mean people have compared his draft value to like hunter green right and and some of these other big names now the obvious danger there prep right-handed pitcher is like a huge red flag by itself <laughs> but uh dylan lesko all kinds of of a praise now for the last few years of draft cycles number seven this might surprise some people i've got elijah green it is impossible to know what a player's approach is going to be like until they get into pro ball he reminds me a little bit of like suli matias so you're never far away from an elite prospect, but I don't know what the swing and miss. I don't know what the approach is like and with a guy like that. It's just, it's boom or bust. You're either mm -hmm. going to draft the next Harper type or the next Bobby Witt Jr. type, or you end up with like a Jason Hayward without the, you know, elite defensive uh, outfield um, production. So Elijah Green, typically with guys like that, if they're not going number one, there's a reason, and that reason is is really is really 
important because of how good the tools are. So I'm wary of guys like Elijah Green, but I got him at number seven on my list. Number six, Jacob Berry, like the opposite of Elijah Green. College bat, left-handed, um, hit tool over power, approach over power, and yet the game power is still there. Hit a couple home runs against Mizzou the other day. Jacob Berry's got, I think, 12 on the season now. So it's not like he doesn't have good power, but with the metal bats in, in college right now, it's kind of hard to tell. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Tennessee got in trouble for maybe using an illegal bat. So I've got Jacob Berry there at number six. He's a outfielder slash not a good defender at all <laughs> out of LSU. <laughs> number five, Chase DeLotter. Chase DeLotter, an outfielder from James Madison, led the Cape in home runs last year. Crazy exit velocities. Good athlete. Big fan of Chase DeLotter. Number four, I've got Drew Jones. I've got Drew Jones, number four, for the same basic reasons. I've got Elijah Green, seven, but the difference is Drew Jones, outstanding defensive center field prospect where Green is probably just a corner outfielder. Again, guys like that who aren't unanimous number one picks, I feel like there's always some sort of if, and, or but. Jared Kellenick is kind of the, the opposite of this. Jared Kellenick went from like a prep guy who was – being ranked lower and drafted higher than people thought. And I feel like when you flip it, when guys fall, that's when you start to get into trouble because the red mm -hmm. flags that some teams pass on are much bigger issues than the public is made aware. So I've got Drew Jones four. I've got Termar Johnson three. Termar Johnson is my favorite prep bat in this draft class. He is a freak. Great raw power, phenomenal hit tool, beautiful swing, plus plus athlete, probably a second baseman, not a shortstop. But who cares? Tamar Johnson is, if it wasn't for the next two guys on my list, I think Tamar Johnson can go 1-1 in a lot of years. I just think this year there are two guys at the top who are freakish college hitters. Number two, I've got Jace Jung, second baseman out of Texas Tech. And then number one, I've got Brooks Lee, a shortstop from Cal Poly. Brooks Lee, what was it? As of last week, he had uh, 25 extra base hits, 30 walks, and 10 strikeouts in 35 games. Uh, Jace Jung, 42 walks, 24 strikeouts, 10 home runs, and on base over 500. I mean, Jace Jung is a freak as well. He just mm -hmm. doesn't have quite the defensive future that Lee does. And I think Lee and Jung's bat, the hit, the hit tools, the power, they kind of mix out. So I went with the defensive tip of the cap there. So there's our top 10. I'll go in reverse order from what I just did. Number one, Brooks Lee. Two, Jace Jung. Three, Tamar Johnson. Four, Drew Jones. Five, Chase DeLotter. Six, Jacob Berry. Seven, Elijah Green. Eight, Dylan Lesko. Nine, Gavin Cross. Ten, Judd Fabian. We will have one more top ten that comes out before our draft guide comes out in late June, early July. So we will rank those one more time before that comes out. Okay, with, that, all, that, with all of that being said, Josh... Do you have any early thoughts on this draft class, the draft cycle, the draft process as it relates to the Royals as we sit here on April 24th with the draft a couple months away? Um, I, I mean, I, I think everybody kind of wants to see a bat added. And like you said in your article, it's very good that that's the case because there are a lot of bats in that top 10 seems very bat heavy uh, outside of, you know, uh, Lesko. He's the only, uh, pitcher in our top 10 he's only pitcher in MLB pipelines top 10 and I think everybody would be pumped to see him in the Royals uniform at that point so everything it seems like it's all lining up to be able to like the top 10 the Royals should be able to have a guy there that will bring quite a bit of electricity quite a bit of upside a lot of you know promise in that in that pick and if it's a bat I'm going to be personally excited because I get more, way more excited about these bats than uh, than I do about the pitchers but it's just going to give the fan base a little bit more to kind of pay attention to, to root for, and to add to this already pretty deep farm system. I'm I'm very interested to see what they do. It, it, there have been times where this has been the case where there's some kind of, you know, seemingly obvious pick last year was kind of that way. It seemed like there was three or four guys that you guys specifically, when you were covering it, were like, this is awesome. This guy, this guy, and this guy were there. Uh, and then they go grab Mazzucato and everybody's like, what? What's going on here? Who was that? So, I, I mean, there's always that p potential for that to happen. And at that point, you just got to like, well, I guess they know what they're doing. Um, 
we, I mean, talking to Ken Swanson, it was a little bit, you know, comparing the, the baseball drafts, with the football drafts, the whole slot kind of variable into this is, is a big, like, regardless of who's there, there could be some antics going on behind the scenes about, you know, this guy doesn't want to draft, doesn't want to sign for anything less than this number. We've only got this. We got to figure out how to make it work or move on. It's just a different variable to it that kind of leaves everybody uh, very much in the unknown when it comes to uh, MLB draft. And with the Royals being at number nine, there's even more like variables going into it to be able to tell what's going to happen. I think my favorite way I've heard it put is that under slotting guys early in round one is like trading down. So basically (laughs) what you have, and I think what the Royals basically told us last year is they had Frank Mazzucato, probably something like 12 to 15 on their board. They were drafting number seven and the gap between Frank Mazzucato and everybody else who was there was not worth $3 million Mm -hmm. or $2 million. Yeah. Royals would have had to have paid pick number seven, something like five mil, somewhere in that range. I can't remember the slot value exactly, but bear with me. They got Mazzucato for three, saved two million, and then gave that to Carter Jensen and Ben mm-hmm. Kudina, which we've seen that start to pay off with Carter Jensen already, right? So, I mean, this yeah. is objectively something that is apparently working. Now, we haven't seen Mazzucato, Kudina, or even Panzini in Colombia yet, but if you if you think about the premise, the, the Chiefs are picking at 29. If they think that the player available, their guy at number 21, is – heads and shoulders better than whoever they're going to get at 29, they'll trade up to go get that guy because they think there's a cliff. It's not Mm -hmm. like picks one through 30 are ranked, right? And player number 30 is almost as good as player number 29 and 28 and 27. It's possible you have like eight players in tier one, four in tier two, no players in tier three, and then Mm -hmm. 20 in tier four, right? And so the, the Royals basically told us, hey, here's what we think. And and so I think the difference between last year and this year is there is a really strong tier one of like 12 guys, maybe nine, 11 guys. Um, And then there's, there's a drop off. And I think they're going to be able to slot in where last year I didn't really blame them. Now, if they would have given Khalil Watson all five mil, I wouldn't have blamed them, Mm -hmm. but I don't think Khalil Watson wanted to sign with just anybody. I think there's a reason he fell. There was some obvious reasons that Kamar Rocker fell. We saw that, right? And Brady mm-hmm. House, like Brady House or Frank Mazzucato, I can have one for two million less than the other. Okay, like I'll I'll take the right. other one. So anyway, I understand the sentiment, and I've seen a lot of jaded Royals fans on online suggest they could trade down, not trade down under slot. I really don't think that'll be the case this year. I think they yeah. take the best bat available. And I really believe it's probably going to be a college bat because there are a lot of college hitters in this draft class. Well, you're talking about the savings from last year. I remember looking, and you, know, you guys posted a question on Twitter uh, about the remaining guys that you know you thought that Mazzucato wasn't under slot. You wanted to know who we wanted to go potentially go out and try to you know throw some money at. And Judd Fabian was one of those dudes that I wanted to, the Royals to invest in. Here we are this year; they could potentially draft him under slot value and then still go get somebody with and pay somebody else to kind of uh, potentially trade back and, you know, add to the system. I love Fabian. I love his profile. Um, and I, I could get on board with that pick for sure, especially if they're able to unslot a bit and then go pick up somebody on the back end. I was looking at the 2013 draft class. Mm-hmm. I'm going to read you a list of everybody that was drafted between the Royals picks of Hunter Dozier and Sean Manaya. You ready? Mm-hmm. I don't know if we're ready for this. Austin Meadows, mm-hmm. Phil Bickford, Dominic Smith, DJ Peterson, Hunter Renfro, Reese McGuire, Braden Shipley, JP Crawford, Tim Anderson, Chris Anderson, Marco Gonzalez, Jonathan Crawford, Nick Kifo. Did not pronounce that right. <laughs> Hunter Hardy, Chichi Gonzalez, Billy McKinney, Christian Arroyo, Eric, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name, but he's not playing, Philip Irvin, Rob Kaminsky, Ryan Stanek, Travis Demerit, Jason Hirsch. I'm going to skip number 32. Yeah, we don't need to talk about that guy. And then Ian Clarkin. So the guy I skipped was Aaron Judge. Hindsight <laughs> being 2020. 
okay. Maybe that's the guy you should have gone with. Sure. But everybody else passed on him too. Some teams more than once. So let's not act like Aaron Judge was a slam dunk pick. Mm -hmm. And then Sean Mania. You tell me which of those guys obviously should have been taken above those two players. Because you can only have one of those other guys other than Dozier and Mania. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked at it. I will. I'll go back and look at it. If you added up the F war of Dozier and Mania, I'm willing to bet you it's higher than everyone on this list, not named Tim Anderson. Yeah, Tim I was gonna Anderson say Tim Anderson and Aaron Judge might be the only two candidates there. And and I'm willing to give him a pass on Judge because he went in the comp round. He didn't even make a he wasn't even a first yeah. round pick. So yeah. if you're looking at it otherwise, I'm willing to bet you the Royals. May and I'll do the research on this. I will post it tomorrow when the podcast comes out. I'm willing to bet you the Royals made the right choice. Mm. And by the way, if Hunter Dozier doesn't get hurt all the time, like he's been productive in his healthy seasons, he looks pretty good this year. Sean Manaya is clearly the best pitcher of this group, I think. Yeah. So I mean, you tell me where they really messed up. I get it. They did it. It looks, I mean, it's not a great look early on when you don't pay because people are like, oh, they're cheap. The Royals are cheap. They're not paying. It's like, yeah, they're giving other people the money. They're just not giving it all to one person. Yeah. Don't put your eggs in one basket sort of thing. We've seen them not do that with Bobby Witt Jr., Brady Singer, right? They had to pay Brady Singer more money than anybody else to sign at 18. Now, again, hindsight being what it is, maybe that wasn't the right pick. But at the time, we didn't even cover him in 2018 because we didn't think there was any way he'd still be available at 18. So, he was number two in MLB pipeline that year, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you tell me when the Royals have underslotted guys and missed, because yeah. objectively you look at it, it's like, eh, I mean, that's not, it's not terrible, right? So, anyway, I even if they do that this year, I trust them. I just don't think that that's a position we're going to be in because the college bat class is so deep. Yeah. And I, I'm kind of – I mean, college bats usually come along usually like three seasons or so, um, and preps are usually between three and five, depending on you know how successful they are to transition. But it does seem like the college bats are a little bit you know further along in their development. They're a little bit older, a little seeing a lot more than these prep guys are. And I, I mean, the last few drafts have been like they need to get some guys in the system, some bats in the system because these pitchers we got enough of them. We I think we're stocked. Let's try to get take some swings. Pat nailed it on these bats, but they never did really uh, in the end. And it kind of at this point, I'm like, well, just do what you need to do. Grab the get guy that you think you could do the most with at this point, because they're obviously building another wave behind you know this wave that we're currently in. And I'm not necessarily that concerned about adding to this major league team because it doesn't seem like the Royals are that interested in adding guys that appear ready. So I, at, at this point, I'm trusting the process. Nailed it. Dayton, that one's for you. Um, I'm going to trust the process and see where we are at the end of it. I've been thinking a lot about draft strategies for baseball teams, and I've basically boiled down to there's two philosophies. You tell me which one you think makes more sense. Don't try to think about it from the Royals' perspective. Don't think about it too analytically. You mm. just tell me, try to apply it to something in your life, and you tell me what you would choose, okay? Okay. Option number one, you draft players that you are less good developing and hope that you can, out, you can draft talent that will outplay your PD. Or B, you draft players that fit your player development, wait and throw darts at the board of guys you don't develop well and hope that something sticks. And if you can't develop any pitchers, you just go pay them in free agency. So specifically as it applies to the Royals, we can draft a bunch of bats, develop the crap out of them and have hitter after hitter after hitter rolling through the system, ignore pitchers a little bit and hope we hit, you know, the jackpot and just get lucky a few times later in the draft hmm. or two would like what they did last year draft a bunch of really high caliber arms in the draft know that that's not our expertise in developing and hope that a few of them stick so think about that in in terms of life i can't think of like a good metaphor right now for life but what's it's like going going through the sense? going to the grocery store and buying things that you know you can cook as opposed to 
I can learn how to do this. I can try to do this. Does that apply? Maybe. Maybe it's more like buying foods that are good for you that you know you don't want to eat. <laughs> that way when you get home, you don't really have a choice and you just kind of have to go through it. Because I can't really think of another... I can't really think of a great example. Like, maybe... Oh, here's a good one for you. You know the the racing games at the arcades? Oh, yeah. Okay. I always had to get the car. I had to sacrifice speed mm. for steering because I could never keep my car on the road. So I would always get the car with the best steering because I could I could shift the gears pretty quick and 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 you know make mm -hmm. up for a lack of speed in my driving, but I couldn't keep it on the road. So maybe that's a better example. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But it's kind of like Mario Kart. It's like are you a Mario or are you a toadstool or are you a Bowser? I was a Bowser. I just yeah, wanted to I, look and I, I wanted people to be scared when I came up on them. Hundred percent. I'm I'm more of a Mario because I need a little bit all around. I need it all around. I don't need to be top heavy on either side. Just give me all around. So Maybe maybe we're coming up on something here. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to think of a good metaphor. I, I've have honestly, we lost I've track of the original. I have thrown <laughs> as much spaghetti at the wall as I can. None of it's yeah. sticking. You get yeah. the point, though. The yeah. Royals have, have have kind of, in a way, shown us we're going to draft as many talented pitchers as we can and just hope hope they stick because they don't mm -hmm. do a great job developing them now. That's not necessarily a knock. There's a lot of teams who aren't very good at developing pitchers, and it's not even that the Royals are awful at it. Think about all the pitchers from that 18 draft class that made the big leagues, who have had a track record of great minor league success. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you draft a Chris yeah. Bubich, he gets lit up in low A, and you're like, oh, well, okay, sorry, we, we missed that one. Like, whoops, right? But they made it. All of these guys have made it. Austin Cox is banging down the door. Jonathan Boland was banging down the door before he got hurt. Like, all of the guys they drafted made it. Kuder Namazucato Panzini. Un unbelievable amounts of talent. Mm. Can't imagine they flame out in low A like the 2015 draft class did, right? We won't yeah. mention those guys, but you, you get the point. Yeah. That doesn't happen all the time. So, I mean, it's not that they do a horrible job at it. They just got to learn to finish it off, finish the deal when they get to the big leagues. So, Anyway, they've shown us a willingness to draft pitchers and, you know, kind of make it do make do with less talented bats, mm -hmm. turning Michael Massey from a fourth round pick to a good hitter, Vinny Pasquantino from an eleventh yeah. round pick to a good hitter. I would like to see them now draft three hitters with your first four picks and turn them into elite hitters when they get in your yeah. system, a la Carter Jensen. So anyway, that's kind of where I'm at with the draft. There's our top ten. The college hitters are deep. I'm really excited for what this draft class could look like. I'm excited for what the Royals could do with that draft class. Um, and by the way, thanks again to Kent for coming on and talking a little NFL draft with us. We we tried to fit this all together here for the theme of the week. But um, any final thoughts on the draft before we get into the minor league minute? Um, I guess kind of going back to it about what I'd like to see him kind of talking about the long lines of what the Royals have done good recently. And that is like, they've made strides at the plate, developing hitters, turning guys that, you know, like you're talking about the Pasquantinos and the, the Masseys, but also the Prados and the Melendezes who seem to have like completely dropped off there two years ago. And then they are completely smashing down the door all of a sudden. So maybe going and grabbing every guy, every bat with extreme upside, extreme tools on the upside, on the offensive end, work with the same repertoire and the same routine that you gave to Prado, Melendez, Pasquantino, and Massey and see what you can get on the top end. So maybe my whole strategy is throwing everything into upside bats and uh, let's pay for pitching on the back end. I don't disagree with that at all. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm on board. So we'll see how that goes. And like I said, we'll have more draft co coverage as we go. But for now, um, we're going to get into the minor league minute brought to you guys this year by drum farm, drum farm, uh, Center for Children out in Lee Summit, right there off Lee Summit Road, right by the golf course. Uh, great facility, great place for foster families to live, raise their families right there on campus. The Compass program I've mentioned several times is for kids who age out of the foster program. I don't know if you guys know this, but at age 18, foster kids are, are on their own, right? And so a lot of them are set up for failure because they've been in the foster care system and now they're on their own, right? The, the Compass program at Drum Farm helps take care of Foster kids who have aged out of the foster care system gives them a place to go, guidance, job help, school help. So 
Very cool thing they got going on. Thanks to Drum Farm for picking up the minor league minute this week. We're going to be quick tonight, Josh. Down yeah. in low A, Daryl Collins is still hitting the ball. I posted pictures on Twitter. He is way more upright than he was last year. Last year he was kind of in a crouch. was very uh, beneficial for him when it came to making contact with his approach. Now he's more upright, should help him hit for more power. And I want people to understand, if you can see me on screen, if not, you know, listen as best you can, think about the plane that you're swinging from when you're crouched down. You're lower to the ground. It is easier to have a flatter swing. When you stand up, all of a sudden your, your swing becomes tilted. It is harder to swing flatter when you're starting higher, right? So, I mean, just the, the, the raw physics of the swing are going to be different. And finding your hands with the barrel meeting a moving baseball when they're starting from a new point is going to be different. It's going to take some time for him to develop. Don't worry if he's not clobbering the baseball early on. He's still hitting the ball well. I think he walked, so he's got like eight or nine walks to like 12 strikeouts. He was in the leadoff spot the other day, which was which was kind of interesting down there in Columbia. So mm. something to keep an eye on. Carter Jensen bashed another home run today. That dude is unbelievable. The amount of raw power he has for an 18-year-old – is crazy. J Josh, three walks today, no strikeouts in that game for Columbia. Very nice. And that brings his, uh, for the week, he was at the five walks to seven strikeouts. So uh, that's very promising to see for sure. The one guy that went nuclear this week, three <laughs> home runs, four doubles in five games, River <laughs> Town. Have yourself a week standing Incredible. ovation. We're going to get the player awards in a minute. You don't need to hear any more. That's our player of the week, <laughs> our weekly MVP uh, here on the minor league minute. River Town went nuclear, literally batting yeah. average like 800-ish for the week. Like I said, three home runs, four doubles. I think he had three or four walks to a strikeout. Five, some crazy. Five, five to two. To strikeout. Two stolen bases. I mean – God almighty Stat, son. Sheet filler. Sheet filler. That Yes, that is a really good way to put it. River Town, by the way, 2021 draftee, was a JUCO kid, tore the cover off the ball at the JUCO ranks, came up last year. Now he's back in Columbia, only 22 years old, so he's not like crazy old for the level. A little old, but not crazy. If he gets to high A this year and keeps hitting, like a guy to keep an eye on, a guy who's going to push himself into our top 50 for sure. We had him close, maybe honorable mention, just as a – a fringe guy last off season, but definitely a guy who can make our top 50 because the, the tools are there. He's a good hitter. Just a matter of see, doing it and seeing it at the full season level. So big week for Rivertown, uh, our MVP of the week here in a minute when we do our player awards on the mound, Luinder Avila was shoving the other night. Mm -hmm. I couldn't stop posting the clips to Twitter. I was watching his start like, Oh, he just did another really good thing. Oh, he just did another really cool thing. <laughs> and then in the fifth inning, runner on third, nobody out. Just go ahead and strike out the side for the yep. end of my scoreless night. Could not have been more impressed by Luinder Avila. Uh, Josh, really quick, any thoughts on that Columbia team? That's uh, Luinder is my pitcher of the week, just, uh, just to kind of get that out of the way. He was absolutely stellar that night. There's been a, a few – Good pitching per performances uh, across the farms, but uh, Luinder was just shoving that night, so uh, it was good to see. But yeah, I mean, we kind of hit him. Ben Hernandez had a tough, uh, tough outing uh, or two, and it was just you know there there is some solid up and down going on in Columbia, which is to be expected in Low A. Up to High A, the Quad Cities River Bandits. Tyler Tolbert had a nice week. Uh, who uh, who hit the oh? Uh, Gerard Gonzalez hit a couple of yeah. home runs today, walked a few times. I mean, he is the epitome of like a guy that you just watch for fun because mm -hmm. he strikes out a bunch, he walks a bunch, and he hits some mammoth home runs. That Quad Cities team today, Luca Tresh hit a couple home runs this week. Yep. They hit some home runs today that were 400 feet plus. Like, mm -hmm. Gerard Gonzalez, two 400-foot home runs. Diego Hernandez, almost 400 feet to right field. Luca Tresh almost 400 feet in the left field. They were not cheap, and I know the wind was blowing out. These weren't pop flies that cleared the fence. These were bombs that Quad Cities was hitting off of Wisconsin's pitching staff today. So big week for the River Bandits, big win today, 18-1. to 1. Uh, That is a 
that is an ass whipping of magnificent <laughs> proportions. <so. laughs> They've put up some big numbers that offense in the last like four days. So that uh, that Wisconsin air must be pretty thin. You get beat by two touchdowns in a baseball game, and you got you got some issues to iron out. So, Didn't the Cubs win by three touchdowns yesterday? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, weird That's, stuff. That is an ass beating. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Massey, Double A, hit his first three home runs of the week. Uh, was whipping his dong out on the Frisco fan base and the pitching staff out there. He has got some magnificent dongage going mm-hmm. on. And, I mean, how appropriate because everything is bigger in Texas. So he goes mm-hmm. down there, and it's a good place to good place to show off your dong if you're going to be doing that <laughs> sort of thing. So. Did it for our boy Joe who's down there uh, yeah, checking right. everybody out in Frisco. So Joel was down the, there getting the – first-hand experience of Michael Massey's dong. Mm-hmm. The other one, Robbie Glendening. I know he's not much for prospect talk, but he had a massive week with his 1365 OPS on this last seven days. Uh, seven walks to seven strikeouts and a stolen base on top of a home run of four, four ribbies. I mean, he was in spring training. We didn't necessarily, I mean, he came out of nowhere and he was late in the spring training. So maybe that says that the Royals are pretty high on him, but, uh, but yeah, kind of came out of nowhere and had a great week. So shout out to Robbie Glendening. Nick Lofton hit a couple home runs this week, including a grand slam. Yep. Suley Matias uncorked a ball over the trees and out onto the street down there in Frisco. That mm-hmm. was incredible. Slider in on his hands, hit it over the over the fence, over the berm, over the whatever the thing they had out there. And then there's like these trees out behind mm-hmm. all that crap in left field. He hit it over the trees out of the stadium. I was like, uh, how did he do that? Like it wasn't even I like love- a full swing. Yeah, it was certainly sort of inside on his hand shortened up like you've been talking about. You nailed it, but it's he always fun to see like the stands. They always like are tracking the ball, trying to go get it. And then you see everybody's shoulders drop because they realize it's completely gone. It's out of there. I love I love. Obviously, I love watching Matias home runs, but I just love seeing air come out of those fans when it leaves the stadium. So at double A down in Springdale, there's the stands in right field behind the bullpen. Then there's like a berm and there's like a, a smaller fence out behind mm-hmm. that. And Prado and Pasquantino peppered home runs over that fence, that back fence a couple times last year. And you can see these kids go running. I'm like, he's gonna hit the fence. And then they always pull up. <laughs> they always, they, they like know where it is. Their awareness is there. But just once, like in the back of my head, I was like, I want to see a kid flip over that fence. Yep. Just like hit it right about waist level and just roll like in in a pursuit yep. of that baseball. Like in the back send of it my in head, the not... send it into Mr. Saget and America's funniest home videos. <laughs> Rest R. in R. peace, P. by the way. Yep. R.I.P. big time. Hey, your boy John Rave is hitting the ball well. Yeah, he is. Ten walks, strikeouts, couple home runs, three Looks stolen really bases. Doing it. Four stolen bases now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He is, yep. I mean playing exactly like I think you thought he would when you draft mm-hmm. him in our league. Good power, good speed. He even got to play a little center field today when Nick Lofton yeah. was DHing. We don't, the, there's not a lot of center fielders in the system, so if you're going to be good at something, be good at something you, the team doesn't have a lot of depth in. Yep. Had himself a good week. So Alec Marsh made another start today, only threw three innings because he did start earlier this week. I'm assuming they're just taking it slow with him. Mm-hmm. Neither start was great. His fastball – when it's in the zone and it's flat, is still kind of home run prone. So yeah. did give up another home run today. Three strikeouts, two walks, not a great outing. Neither outing for him was outstanding this week. But Alec Marsh did make a couple starts. He appears to be healthy uh, in AAA. Vinny Pasquantino just continues to mash the baseball. Mm-hmm. Nick Prado got a couple of days off against some tough lefties. He looked better for it when he got back today. Imagine that, Joshua. If you give guys days off, they come back rested. I don't think that that's you know something we can translate to the major league level, though. Let's just relax on that. Do you think Matheny knows that? Do you think he? <laughs> no. Do you think like in the back of his head? Do you think he knows that sitting with like playing with Merrifield every day is detrimental to his performance? I, I mean, at this point, everybody loves Wit, and I think that it's just like a, I, I do think that he's the leader in that clubhouse. I think it was Salvi, and I think you know, I think Wit's kind of taken on that that torch a little bit in that capacity. But it, so I understand why a manager would stick with him and keep you know just kind of maybe take him down a slot in the lineup, and hopefully something will you know 
like like Joel likes to say, is rattle the bat rack and mix things up, change the mojo, whatever you want to call it. If it changes something for the good, great, but they're not going to completely take them out of the lineup until things are dire. And boy, he got pretty dire today. Pretty gross. That last at bat he had was awful. And I don't even yeah. blame Wit all the time anymore. And 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 to, to anyone listening who thinks I'm being a little condescending when I asked if Matheny knows that it's detrimental. Yes, I am I am being a little facetious in terms of like obviously Mike Matheny is aware of that stuff like that exists, right? I'm not yeah. under the impression. But I do think in some way they have lied to themselves about Wit not needing a day off because at some point if they would give him a day off, right? Like mm. if they didn't if they weren't lying to themselves, if they really knew this was detrimental to his performance, they would give him a day off, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean that they did sense. it with Carlos Santana early in the week. So, so at at some point, it's okay to think that maybe they really don't know, or am, mm-hmm. am I just? I don't know. I I mean, he's he's the manager. We're not. That's just my best argument for for <laughs> being able to second guess somebody that's in, that's been chosen to be in that position. But I I can't tell. I can't say that I know better than him. But at the same time, like some of these things, you do have to ask about, like the day off for Wit uh just i mean just in general so i I totally understand it but i'm not going to be the one to be like knowing better than mike Matheny at this point that is always the 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 tough thing and i and i mention it all the time like these guys get paid to do the job that's why Mm -hmm. they don't ask me for my opinion like I, i feel like i'm pretty transparent about that but at some point like i have to ask it's like because it's like right you have to know it's like you have to know like we all know you have there's obvious situations like that too yeah, so it's I, I don't know. Bullpen continues to be pretty good. Dylan Coleman, despite the command today, I thought I mean his fastball is unhittable. Mm-hmm. Like he couldn't throw his fat slider anywhere near the zone, and yet guys are not hitting his fastball. Like they know it's the only thing he's going to throw for a strike, and yeah. they're not hitting it. So love watching him pitch. Mm-hmm. That has been the minor league minute brought to you by Drum Farm. Thanks again to them for picking up the minor league minute for the 2022 season. Okay, really quick. MVP of the week, Rivertown. Mm-hmm. My player of the week is Nick Lofton. Pitcher of the week, I've got uh, Jonathan Heasley. He made two outstanding starts, six innings today. Did give up three earned runs, still a quality start. Uh, I think four strikeouts, either no or one walk. So not a bad not a bad outing at all. Had another good mm-hmm. outing on Tuesday earlier in the week. Uh, you had, who did you say you had? Uh, Luinda Avila, his start down in uh... – what am I thinking? Columbia. Columbia. Yeah. Five innings pitch. He only had two base runners and five strikeouts. Uh, I'll take that. We, we talked about him this year and kind of keeping an eye on his progress and uh, kind of a rough start those first two or three starts. But today or this week, he looked really, really good. Um, kind of upset with you for taking Nick Lofton for, uh, for my player of the week because it just looked like everything, every time I'd look on Twitter, it's Nick Lofton doing, hitting a home run, making a great catch in center field. He just had a great, great week. So, a little bit upset with you for taking uh, for taking him away from me. Uh, Vinny had a great week. Brewer Hicklin had a great week. Um, and I think I settled on – time out, time out. Yeah, I'm going Gerard Gonzalez. Okay. Just absolute sheet filler. Great, you know, great week between uh, the two jacks and eight ribbies and seven walks and three strikeouts with the stolen base as well to go with it. A 1397 OPS – Give it to me every time with Gerard Gonzalez. I've mentioned it, him before. I love watching him play. Again, mm-hmm. I'm not suggesting he's the best prospect. I do think he's maybe a little underrated. The strikeouts are concerning, but mm-hmm. he's so much fun. Today, did you see him pimp that home run? It was at the yes. end of the video. Yeah. So if you watch the home run, the camera pans to right field as the ball is soaring out of the stadium, and then they come back and show a replay, and he just walked a little bit. Mm-hmm. Dropped his bat, off he went. I was like, "Ooh, he knew it. He knew he got it." I love it when guys know they get it. That's just yep. I love, love a good pimp job, but I also very much enjoy the been here before. I'm just going to take my home run and walk and get back to the bench. So any final thoughts? Too. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, if, uh, there's something to be said for that. I do love. I do love that as well. All right, Josh. Final thoughts. Uh, final thoughts is uh, when uh, the major league bullpen blows up. Uh, specifically a left-handed reliever. Uh, It's never fun and not a good look 
to call, to call them out on Twitter. If you are also a left-handed reliever that is currently not on a big league, maybe, I don't know, maybe on an injury rehab assignment or something, who knows? Uh, it's interesting that you would choose to put out an emoji to call those guys out. So it's just, just a weird, weird look for that. I think I saw not that. that, not that there's anybody specific that did that or anything. I saw that Saturday night and I was, you know, I think there are a lot of people who were reacting to that. And I was like, man, if, you, if, if you, if, if this person was pitching in triple a and not getting the opportunity to pitch in the big leagues, I would say, like, I would agree. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of wonder if the timing wasn't just ironic and it was just like a really bad time to tweet that at the same time. It is, it's, it's, yeah, you gotta be careful with stuff like that. So yep. I did if it's cryptic, that. I mean it could be translated either way. And uh that's how the you, majority, you vast that. majority of guys are. I had a conversation with us with some high school kids recently. Like it doesn't really matter what you are using social media for. If it can be translated negatively against you, don't do it. Yep. Take yep. it off of your social media feed. Don't allow it to become an issue. That is the issue sometimes with social media. My final yep. thought on the night is we need to build domes over golf courses. Mm. I stepped up on a tee box at Winterstone on Saturday, and a buddy of mine that I play with, he every now and then will pop a golf ball up, and it's kind of funny. I mean, I've never seen a guy hit a <laughs> golf ball as high as he can hit them, and it's not like he does it on purpose. He just uh-huh. if he misses with his driver, like m- when I miss my driver, it goes 400 yards to the right. It's mm-hmm. it's it's over the highway, through the over the river, through the trees to grandma's house, however that song goes, that's where it's going. His miss is he'll pop the ball up and hit it, I don't know, 50, 60 yards out in front of him and way up in the air. It is crazy. Mm-hmm. We get up on a tee box, and we're probably, I don't know, I'm not very good at judging like depth, but we are way above the fairway. So the way it plays is you you go out, and then the green is actually close to being – the same height as the tee box mm, the airway mm-hmm. is way down. And so he, the wind is straight in our face coming like, you know, <laughs> through the, through the fairway and just blowing straight into our face. He had one of those swings. He popped the golf ball straight up into the air and it landed about 50 yards behind us into the jet. Nice. I grabbed a three iron, didn't even tee it up, aimed from the top of the tee box, tried to hit the ball straight down onto the fairway and the wind picked it up, and it went way up into the air, landed about 107, maybe 75 yards to 100 yards out in front of me on the fairway. But it was like, this is ridiculous. How do you hit a ball, ball in the torrential wind? And then it starts raining on us, ruined the rest of the round. Build domes over all the golf courses, <laughs> and weather doesn't have to be a play in play. I'm tired. Well, that's of part wind. of golf, right? I'm tired of the rain. I want to play golf all the time. I don't want to have to worry about it being 10 degrees in December. I just want to be able to go golf. Like that's what yep. I want. Or we need to get you, we need to get you some blading lessons. So you're just like worm burning it all across the range. Just, <laughs> just straight and fast. This might be a better idea. You tell me what you think of this. Stop yeah. building bowling alleys. Start building bars with golf simulators. Yeah, I, I, was kind of, I don't understand why that's not a thing anyways. I, I've seen some of them starting to pop up, but it seems, I mean, like tee shots and, and top golf, huge successes, pretty close, mm-hmm. but you don't need all that room. It feels like the simulators are just as good now, so you can just yes. pop up a bar like that with a bunch of them and call it a day. Put some golf simulators in the bar, like a bunch of them. Go in mm-hmm. there, sit down with your buddies, get a bucket, sit there and hit into the simulator. I don't yep. know how the putting would work, but putting is the worst part of the sport anyway. You don't need to putt. Hit the ball into the green, and however many feet away you are is divided by 10. That's the number of strokes you get for your putts. Let's mm-hmm. go home. I mean, let's. Yep. That's that needs to be a thing. So either dome the courses or build more golf simulators and bars. That's my favorite. Hear that, Elon Musk? Million dollar gonna, idea just for you. He's going to do it, and he's going to do it like in Mars where I can't get to it. <laughs> He's like, I got you. you. He's like, I'm gonna go to Mars. Drive in that gravity. Uh, I didn't thought about that. Driving the ball. Well, and that's kind of like that article about Whit Merrifield leading the league in home runs if we played on the moon. Yep. Do you remember that? Yep. And now he can't hit 200. It's also not a very good throw from right field. That was you. What'd you say? It was the worst throw since 50 Cent. (laughs) 
Yeah. Worst throw home than since 50 cent his first pitch. It was not good. And um, I don't know if he just got amped up and wanted to make a play, which is I've totally been there before, but boy, it was not good. Sacrificing his defensive ability at second base for, by the way, what we haven't talked about and we're done. I don't want to talk about this tonight, but Mondesi hasn't missed a game yet. Mm -hmm. And you just out there playing, which is awesome, but he sucks. But I mean, he's awful right now. It is hard to watch. Speaking of a guy who just can't get a day off while Whit Merrifield goes out in the right field at a worse position and just, just, ah, okay. Anyway, that's been it for tonight. Thanks for listening again. Thanks to KCSC for picking up the podcast, our title sponsor. Thanks to Drum Farm for picking up the Minor League Minute. Thanks to KCSN for having us. Thanks to Kent Swanson for coming on talking football. I know he's, I know he's busy, but the draft is this week, and we're talking MLB draft. So I wanted to, you know, combine those two awesome things. I got Tony G on this side of me and Alex Gordon on this side of me. So my two favorite things we talked about, my two favorite sports we talked about it combined the draft talk. So. Josh, thank you for joining me tonight. We'll be back at it next Sunday. We'll recap the NFL draft a little bit, and we'll talk about some minor league baseball. Hopefully we'll have a guest next week. I think we're going to have – I think I think I got something lined up. So we'll see you about next week. Sounds great. I'll see you then. Thanks for listening, guys.